Now, you moved to CBS where you did Odyssey and Oracle, right? Yes, yeah. Uh, um, who, who was the one that first noticed the spelling error on the record? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think it was Rod. Um, because Terry Quirk, who did it, we, mm. Rod, he and I shared a flat in North Finchley. And funnily enough, uh, he, he sketched out some ideas and he did that flowery thing. And we thought, oh, that's a great idea. And we didn't see it until the, the first trial things come through. And we thought, we've got to change that. And uh, he said, it was too late. We're, it's in process now. Rod and Colin were in an interview with me and we were talking about how we said it was a cross between an ode and an odyssey. Uh, um, <laughs> and, and we said, and Colin told me, I said, you never told me that. <laughs> 30 years I've thought that was the reason. They didn't know it was a spelling mistake. <laughs> Brilliant, yeah, brilliant. Yeah. Anyway, but you know, that was a very interesting time in, in rock, and you were at the center of it, because now rock and roll was not just singles for teenagers anymore. It was starting to become an art form, and, and Odyssey and Oracle was meant to be listened to as an entire piece. Yes, that wasn't. Uh, the story is basically, um, we were sent to the Philippines by a manager who incidentally stole two million quid off us, oh. basically. And he, we didn't have any work in England. And we said, have you got any work? I'll give you 10 days in Manila. And he said, um, for a hundred quid. Mm -hmm. He said, well, each is no between you. So we went over and he said, they'll pay for everything, all accommodation, all your equipment, everything. So we go over there thinking we're playing in a hotel lobby. And basically we arrive at three o'clock in the morning at Manila airport with thousands of kids and we were driven in a parade in the middle of the night through, and we'd stop outside this great big building. And they said, what's this? He said, that's where you're playing. It was the Araneta Coliseum. It was the second biggest Astrodome. Oh we played to 30,000 people for 10 days for 18 pounds each night. <laughs> <laughs> so we came back from there with no money, no manager, and the Decca had dropped us. So we decided to produce, Rod and I decided to produce ourselves mm. because we, we weren't happy with the way the recordings were going. Right. We weren't allowed to be in the mix sessions for a start. Mm -hmm. and, and he and I were the main writers. Mm -hmm. So we said, we'd like to go and do our own recordings. So a um, publisher said, I've, CBS will offer you a thousand pounds and I can get you into Abbey Road. Ooh. Thousand pounds is not much for Abbey Road. So we had to do very quick sessions. And that was our first production, Rod mm -hmm. and myself doing it. And I forgot what the question was. Well, it's just that the era of rock was changing from doing singles now to albums. That's right. Well, we, we recorded it. It was on four track. Right. But we took advantage of the, the Beatles had wanted to do eight because they'd heard Pet Sounds. Right, right, right. And uh, we didn't have eight track in this country at the time. Mm. But the Beatles asked the EMI engineers to sort something out. So they linked two four right, tracks right, together. Right, yeah. And so we did it like when we recorded originally, it was bass, drums, uh, and guitar on one track, mm -hmm. Colin on another, keyboards on another, and backing vocals on another four tracks. Mm. And so we mixed it all down for the thousand pounds in mono. Then the record comes, ah, stereo is becoming an interesting thing. Can you go back and remix it in stereo? <laughs> so we, Rod and I paid out another thousand pounds to do it in stereo. 